My name is Martin Lambert. Um, I'm the founder of Xvisory. Xvisory is a much earlier stage um, AI startup based just outside of Oxford, pre product. And this presentation is called The Far Side of AI because there is another side of AI other than machine learning. It's um, very, the, the current massive resurgence of interest in AI, you could be forgiven for thinking it's, it's synonymous, AI is now synonymous with machine learning. But there's over 50 years of research and activity in, in artificial intelligence, during the majority of which there's been two big parallel tracks to AI. There's been the kind of data-driven AI that, that uh, the previous speaker was talking about, an excellent example of that. And there's been logic AI, um, which is this idea of chaining together high-level logical statements that actually even dates back to antiquity. We're all familiar with Socrates as a man, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates uh, is mortal. And that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, in this uh, brief presentation. Now, the question that Xvisory is asking the market and that I'll be discussing in this presentation is, are we missing out on um, logic AI opportunities? Because everything, every time we consider an, a, 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 an application for which AI might be suitable, uh, we just look at the, at the machine learning side, the data-driven pattern recognition side of things. And the reason I mention internet is if you look at why is machine learning, why is suddenly machine learning, which has been around in a recognisable form for about 30 years, why has that suddenly exploded onto the stage? And there are multiple reasons. There's two real big reasons. One is, yeah, massive cumulative advances in the algorithms, the kind of de deep learning techniques that Tractable use. The secondary side is that these deep learning techniques are dependent upon large amounts of data and large amounts of CPU in order to train these, these sophisticated mathematical models. And so the, kind of, the secondary question that Xvisory is looking at is, is there a similar thing where, by combining the revolutionary capabilities of the internet with, what's been, with classical logic AI, are there new opportunities? And if the kind of machine learning is all heading off that way, is the, is the next kind of potential wave in AI to do with um, logic AI? So 18 months ago, um, we were looking at you know, what, would, what would make a fantastic application for AI. And this applied AI is, you know, I think you're all interested in applications of AI rather than big discussions about theory. What would be a great application? Where could kind of really um, intelligence be used? And the thing we were looking at was post-sales product support. You've bought a complicated product like a mobile phone or a computer and you encounter a problem with it. So you then want to go and get support from the vendor. And if you search for post-sales product support, these are the images you get off Google. You'll, be, you know, you'll pick up the phone, you'll be connected with bright-eyed, intelligent, highly educated, even physically attractive people that will help you <laughs> solve your problems. Now, every time marketing kind of shows something like that, clearly they're hiding something. So we all know really what the experience is of um, getting help on, on products. Now, to be fair, I am going to make fun of some companies and, and their support. But to be fair, I'm really talking about complicated products like a computer or a mobile phone or a central heating system that are sold to millions of people at relatively modest margins. So what that means is you, don't have, you have lots of people, lots of potential problems coming back to the companies, wanting help, but your margins are so that you don't have pots of cash sitting around to provide expert level kind of advice to people. So today when you pick up the phone or you get on chat, you're often talking to minimum wage, out, kind of offshore, outsourced kind of customer support that is slavishly following scripts and is a horrible experience. In actual fact, if you look at the way things are going, a lot of companies are just saying, I can't do this, I can't afford to do this well, it's too brand damaging. So you go and support yourself. We might put up articles on a website. We might encourage you to figure it out through a community self-help forum. Typically when they're run by um, the manufacturers of products, they're fairly dreadful. This is a picture, I confess, from Vodafone. I hope there's no Vodafone employees here. But it's a picture from Vodafone's self-help forum. The most popular article on that site is poor customer service with thousands of, um, thousands of views. That's really brand damaging. Um, the best probably today, really, is if you're, from, if you're ha happy using the internet, is a combination of one of the remarkable capabilities of the internet, kind of free text search Google style, with moderated, well-moderated um, community forums like Stack Exchange, Quora, and the like. Obviously, this would be the topic of a, a Dilbert cartoon. Everyone knows Dilbert. 
I'll let you read the Dilbert cartoon. And actually, there is a serious purpose, which is, what's the, what are the information flows? If we're going to apply AI to this, what are the information flows and the inputs and outputs? At the end of the day, product support, we're just talking about predicting ordered sequences of questions and, and, and answers in such a way. And, and those questions have a cost. You don't want to be asked a million questions. You don't want to be asked irrelevant questions. And you don't want to be asked the same questions again and again. And hopefully, you want to get some answers. So that's the application that we're looking at applying AI to. And I need to put the glasses on. So let me, let's see what might that look like if, it were, if that support were provided by an AI. And what we imagine is, um, and Xvisory's pilot application to prove the technology is a, is a question and answer chat support for mobile phones or tablets and problems with those devices. <coughs> so imagine that I went to the Vodafone site, and instead of, um, and as, as well as being offered all the conventional support, I now offer the ability to have um, to support myself by, by chatting with an AI. So I'm saying I can't send emails on my iPhone. Now, behind the scenes, the, I'm going to we'll, we'll pretend, we'll just play act, that the actual problem, I can't send emails, but the problem is I'm inside a building, I don't have mobile phone reception, and I'm having a subtle problem with the Wi-Fi. So now I'm going to just click through this um, to show you. It's going to drive, it's going to ask me questions, and then, and initially, in any product support, there's really three phases. It's going to find out about you and your product. It's going to find out about the symptoms you're experiencing. And then the interesting stuff starts, which is then going to try and diagnose the problem. I'm not talking about simple support where you just need to look up something, ask a single quest, a simple question, be rooted to a simple answer. There needs to be some thoughtful diagnosis. So it asks me a series of questions. For example, am I accessing the, uh, the, the web application from the device experiencing a problem or another one? Am I using um, Apple or Android? And it's interesting because already after asking that you're using Apple, it's now going to ask me what version of iOS am I using? So already it's, it's conscious of the previous answers. And when it asks me what version of iOS they're using, which may be relevant to uh, diagnosing this problem, it, it's going to link me to um, article. It's, it's, it's going to link me to how do, if you don't know what that question means or how to find software on your phone, just click on the following link and it will take you due to a, through to a curated article how to answer that question. So I'm running at, say, iOS 10. I haven't upgraded. I'm running on a phone. And now, uh, and, uh, and it's uh, an iPhone 6S. I'm clicking through, and each stage it's pointing me to Apple specific things. I'll, I'll ask you to trust me that if I went back and changed that to Android, it would, ask, it would, it would show me links to Android um, related web pages. Now it reaches the point of, um, of asking what are the symptoms of the problem. So, my symptom in this case is I can't access email. And as it goes, it's explaining what it's doing. And we're now getting to the interesting point of doing diagnosis. It's explaining what it's doing, giving me links to uh, relevant data. And it's aware of the cost of questions. It's trying to minimize the number of questions it asks and order. So for example, on the Vodafone website that I pointed to before, many of the Vodafone employees, the first thing they ask you, they say, have you tried doing a factory reset on your phone? They're completely unconscious of the cost. Oh, sure, I'll just factory reset my phone, reinstall my apps, re restore all the settings that I put into that. It's almost as if they just want you to go away. Whereas switching your phone on and off, which is famous from a, a kind of a TV show, is actually a very f easy thing to do, very simple to try, and it's the right time to try it here. So, but unfortunately, switching my phone on and off doesn't actually solve the problem. So now it knows it's an email problem. It could well be a network. So it's going to say, let's do, it's going to, it's going to, it's, it's explaining itself a lot. It's saying, let's do some network tests. Remote, even though it's asking lots of questions, this is completely self-service. You can go and walk the dog. You can, there's no, you're not feeling, oh God, I, I need to hang on the line because either hang on the line or hang on the chat because otherwise I'll get another person and ask me the same questions. It's very easy to, um, to pick this up, put it down. So now it's asking me a bunch of questions, and I'll, I'll click through them because I'm sure you're getting the idea. Because I've got a Wi-Fi problem, I can't, I can't browse. I can't browse to oops, I can't browse to secure sites. I can't send emails. I can't receive emails. Um, and so then it, it starts to show me intermediate conclusions. So it says, you know, you can't. 
uh, every, every network test we've done so far has failed. So the problem is actually with the, your connection to the internet rather than with email. What kind of uh, network are you using? And what I'm really trying to just get at is it's, it's going to do some reasonably deep uh, diagnosis here. So are you, are you running in flight mode? Have you accidentally stuck the, your device in flight mode? Is Wi-Fi enabled on your device? Yes, it is. And each time it's showing me links to how to answer those questions. Um, does re disabling and re-enabling, that could easily um, uh, fix the problem on your phone. Oops, I actually meant to say no. So, uh, so I'll, go, I'll go there. So what's the name of your network? Name's wi my Wi-Fi. Um, and so then it's going to do things like, it's, you can see that it's kind of quite cleverly just navigating its way through and saying, can another device use the Wi-Fi network? And, and we'll say, yes, another device can. And from then it's going to conclude, that means that it's probably the fault is with your device rather than with another device, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll just keep, I'll keep whizzing. Now, just a couple of other things. Let's say um, English isn't my first language because this is now, this comes back to my point about the internet enabling all sorts of capabilities. Let's say um, English is my first language. Let's say I need that in Georgian. I hope there's no uh, there's any Georgian speakers in the room. This is probably, you know, this is a Google translation. We're just doing nothing particularly clever. But, um, and you wouldn't, and this may be a poor translation, but it's probably, it's still nonetheless an effectively tr translation. Uh, so we'll just uh, say we, um, we are connected to the Wi Fi network. It suggests forgetting and reconnecting to the Wi Fi network. And it's diagnosed your, your fault, but you can see that it's actually, in this particular, just one example, it's been quite a systematic troubleshooting um, trip. So if I now just return to the presentation. So how, how do you go about building a, a, a support AI chat that is capable of doing that kind of level of diagnostics? Well, when, when we first looked at it, we were thinking, well, sure, we'll, we'll use machine learning. AI, after all, seems to be synonymous with machine learning. And it's all about predicting question and answer pairs. And predicting ordered sequences, that's grist to the machine learning mill because there's lots of um, machine learning techniques that can predict ordered um, sequences like recurrent neural networks. The question is, do I have the huge volumes of quality information that Tractable mentioned that with which I can train my data. And that means, do I have lots and lots of pre-recorded question and answer sessions that I can use to train my machine learning system? And when you look at these big repositories of, of question and answers, there is far more noise than signal for training. And while machine learning can be very resilient to noise, it generally you have to have reasonable data in order to uh, train these systems. That would include all the explanations and the like. And what you find is that when you approach these problems, you're looking for applications that, are, that humans, intelligent humans can do, and you want to apply AI to them. But the modern practitioner of AI will look at lots of applications and say, well, I can't do that, and I can't do that because I don't have data, so I'll move on to the applications for which I do have or can obtain training data. And it's interesting, though, because so there's lots of applications where you don't have quality learning data, and yet the expertise is there. Returning to Vodafone, cancel your contract and you'll soon find yourself rooted through to a competent support person who may be able to who may be able to um, solve your problem and there's many applications like diagnostics medical diagnostics constrained design for example filling out tax returns for which training data uh, is often not available but expertise is and it's kind of why uh, example is another analogy is why it's why pigeons don't ruin the world. If you think about the way human intelligence works, there's two sides to it. The subconscious pattern recognition, perception, how you recognise spoken the spoken word, how you recognise the written word, intuition, the way uh, like an experienced inspector of photographs of insurance claims can recognise fraud, how a, how an experienced mechanic can listen to a car and tell you roughly what's wrong with it. But there's also high-level reasoning, like a detective. You know, how do they figure out which witnesses to, uh, to question, what questions to ask, how to interpret forensic evidence? It's kind of the difference between experience and expertise. And it's not a competition between the two. We don't rule the roost over pigeons because logic AI is better than, than, um, than pattern recognition or machine learning. It's because we can recognize patterns as well as pigeons, but we can also think at a very high level. We want to capture that in AIs. So just incredibly quickly, how does logic AI work? It's chaining back and forward between rules. 
So this is often explained using a silly uh, kind of fun example, which is imagine in a room next door, there's a grumpy teenager, doesn't like ask, answering questions, he's got a telephone and he's given a box, there's something in the box, we want to tell what colour animal is in the box. So on the right we have a logic AI, it's just a set of rules, these rules have been programmed into it by a human, they're glorified if-then statements if there's any programmers in the room. Things like if x croaks and x eats flies, it's a frog. If it's a frog, it's green. On the right-hand side, we have facts. In this case, we don't have any facts. We have an AI inference engine, and all it does is it scuttles back and forward, comparing the rules with the facts, looking to increase facts. That's what it lives for, is to increase facts. And it, you chain backward through the rules until you can't chain any further, and that tells you what questions to ask. So we can ask, what does it eat? It eats fly. It, sorry, what noise does it make? What does it eat? It eats flies. And then we chain forward through the rules. So as soon as we know it croaks and it eats flies, we know it must be a frog. If we know it's a frog, that activates the second rule. We know it's green. We've solved the problem. That is literally, yeah, that is literally how uh, Logic AI works. And it does some amazing things. One, written in the past that they have that they've demonstrated that they can out consistently outperform humans. They're very transparent. The, the rules are all very logical and linguistic. Um, so it can explain things like, for example, why it turns down a credit card application or whatever it's solved. Um, but in the past, there have been the issues with making logic AI work in practice have been to do with complexity when, it, as you scale up to usefulness, and, um, and lack of integration with anything because a lot of this technology was last used um, before the internet. So what Xvisory is, it's a set of, it's a platform as a service that gives visual editors so that you can readily construct these logic AIs. And it's very, it's called application specific logic networks in that the network, the logic network is very specific to the problem at hand. And so in the case of fault diagnosis, you're trying to isolate problems between, for example, on a mobile device, is it a network or an app problem? What tests can I run to either eliminate the network and all of its subfaults, or scope the network so that I can eliminate everything else and to progress through that hierarchy? And so the engineer or the support engineer who's writing Logic AI is effectively just putting tests into this network uh, in a very logical and predictable manner. And then when you push the button um, from the, um, the, the, um, the visual editors, it actually just generates procedural code like Java or Groovy or Python or what have you. Or it generates a chat app or it can generate an, an iOS or an Android app. And it's just conventional code that it generates so you can use existing debuggers, test frameworks. It can as easily ask a question as it calls out to an API. And intuitively what we're, it's actually doing is it's serving as kind of a curated guide through, in the course of diagnosing a problem, it just it, it takes you from article to article showing you how to perform each of these tests. It's like a curated guide to this knowledge labyrinth. 